All right, campers. Oh, we have gone a long way in the history of Israel. A long way. And uh, now we are in um, the mid-500s uh, B.C. And we're looking at, so what happened after Babylon? So here's just a, a brief historical outline of what's going on that involves the return. First off, Assyria persecuted Persia way before while they were in power. So as a result, they helped Babylon to defeat Assyria. But then later, um, Persia would, would defeat Babylon. And the interesting thing is that the Cyrus was actually related distantly um, to Nebuchadnezzar's um, kingship, I guess you could say. Um, so... And Persia helps helps Babylon defeat Assyria. That's 612 when Nineveh is destroyed. 609 when uh, when Nineveh I mean when Assyria uh, falls. Um, but um, and and Babylon is very much so arrogant. And, and and once again, you know, Belshazzar is over there rejoicing in the Book of Daniel. You know, throwing this feast, and that very night they're defeated by Persia. I mean, goodness sakes, how arrogant can you be? Um, and and uh, Babylon is used very frequently as a symbol of evil. Not to say that every time that Babylon is in prophecy, it's talking about an image. Sometimes it's actually talking about the actual place. But in, like in Re Revelations, for instance, Babylon is used uh, as a as a image, I guess, for uh, for Rome. So Persia becomes a power in about 549, and then cap is it, it, it captures Babylon. In 539, so it's only 10 years from their rise to to, to power, and uh, kind of fast. I mean, I, I, if I was Babylon, I would have probably taken care. But, um, so they're captured in 539. Um, Cyrus, in seeing that um, the people are discontent and the people of Babylon themselves are also discontent, he returns the stolen gods and he returns the displaced peoples. Just ha allows everybody to go home. Um, it wasn't just the Jews that he let go. He also let a large, a large amount of other people go back. Um, and obviously, you know, he secured his his reign through through um, through good deeds. Babylon and Assyria secured their reign through terror, but Persia did it through uh, through being the good guys. So the first immigration back is in the very next year. Babylon is taken over in 539. In 538, the very next year, uh, Cyrus allows allows people to go, and he gives that edict. So, but however, the work stops on the um, the temple in 530. So then Zechariah and Haggai somewhere around there. So then Zechariah and Haggai prophesy around 520, and the temple is finished in 516. So. Um, Obadiah prophesies in, the, in around 500, Joel prophesies around 500, and Esther happens sometime around 483. Now, all of this happens. Ezra starts off with the first immigration that skips all the way down through here to after four, the 480s, and which takes us to the second immigration, as reported in Ezra, in around chapter 7, in 458. So it passed from, um, from 538... To 458, almost a hundred years. I mean, that's a good deal of time. So then the wall is finished um, in the book of Nehemiah in 445. So uh, first and second chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, all finished sometime around 450 to 400. And then Malachi prophesies in 433, and he is the last event of the Old Testament before the New Testament, which leads us to the 400 years of silence, the time between the end of Malachi to the beginning of the New Testament. So. All right, so here's here's Media here, and here's Persia, Persepolis, and Susa, um, two of the big cities there. Uh, remember, here's the mountains here, the Zagros Mountains. Uh, so came over here, and boop, there's Babylon. <clears throat> so that takes us to the books of First and Second Chronicles. Now, actually, I like the Chron books of Chronicles, I think, more than Kings, even though they have the genealogies, because um, I just like the information more. It's more hopeful. It's it's more you know, um, more. Eh, it also just follows the line of David, which I find very helpful. I hate how kings, um, the books of kings, hops back and forth, and it's so hard to remember because he'll be going down with one king, and and then he'll just 
is to take this break and go down like four kings and then return back to this king. It's like, whoa, slow down. So then you have to go back and you're trying to figure out a timeline of what's going on. First and Second Chronicles does he mess with that. After you get past the genealogies, it briefly mentions King Saul, very briefly. And then it goes to the reign of David, the reign of Solomon, and then all of the other kings. In order, in, in, in nice, clean, it's just so much easier for me to understand. But um, it was possibly written by Ezra and Nehemiah, maybe around like 450 or 400, it maybe. But I wouldn't put much stock into Ezra and Nehemiah writing it, um, especially it seems the dating. I mean, um, you know, if... if the events of Nehemiah happened in 445. I mean, it's possible, but I wouldn't put all my eggs in that basket. Um, so the purpose is to give hope and to remind that God is still at work and they have a heritage of faith. If you look in First and Second Chronicles, bad things are punished quickly and good things are are are, are given quickly. Um, once again, it's showing that that God is at work and that and that um, those. those um, the results of what's going on. Now, if you notice, in First Chronicles, actually starts with the genealogy, and the reason for that is because he's trying to trace not to give not to give a family history for no reason. Okay, that that's not important. In fact, he skips a lot of things and, and he adds a lot of things and that kind of stuff. But what he does is he is he outlines a good little um, thing to give the people hope and to remind them where they came from. To give to to outline who their parents were and and, and where they came from, and um, just just to give them to give them hope in, in their in their heritage. And as you read through there, understand that it's not being written as a complete history. In fact, all the geneal genealogical accounts were never meant to be taken verbatim. For this is literally the the exact descendant of this person, and that wasn't even their purpose ever. So, you know, don't don't go quoting something that, you know, was not even intentioned by the author. He's just trying to draw them into that heritage that they have. Um, and obviously with, with the different people that, that, that they've been a part of and, and, and what was accomplished with those things and what, where, where their family trees came from. You know, these are important things. You know, hey, you have a heritage of faith and God is at work. So... Um, it is com a commentary in the sense that it is very selective. Uh, it doesn't include the sin with Bathsheba at all. Um, it, in fact, it, it actually spins even the negative people in a positive light. Um, Manasseh, for instance, it mentions his uh, repentance. I mean, when Kings made it sound like he had no repentance, and that was just the end of that. You know, it's just totally different feel. Um, so it is selective. The same as first and saying Kings was selective. It is it is selective. Um, Saying Chronicles 33, 10 through 17 is actually the story of um, how Manasseh repents. So, so the genealogies are in the first nine chapters of First Chronicles, and then the rest of First Chronicles is devoted to David's reign. Um, if you notice, uh, another key theme throughout First and Second Chronicles is the temple and the work being done there. They'll be done talking about the stuff that's going on, and then they'll say, "Now, then they did this at the temple." And this person was involved, and this person was involved. Why? See what I mean? Um, a strong emphasis on the on the temple and the work done there, and the heritage of faith. It says it in many different ways about how they have a heritage of faith. Um, so then, uh, Second Chronicles picks up with the reign of Solomon, the same as First Kings had picked up with the reign of Solomon. Um, but it doesn't mention too many bad things about him either. Um, <coughs> and then the rest of Second Chronicles, from chapter ten to chapter thirty-six. Is devoted to um, to talking about the kingdom of um, Judah, the rest of the, of the kingdom. Um, so King Cyrus's edict is how the book ends in 539. This was either to transition it to Ezra. Um, I know that's a little bit confusing. Um, that's Saint Kings 36, 22 through 23. Okay. Um, I know it says Ezra 36, 22 through 23. I meant transition to Ezra. In Second Kings 36, 22 through 23. I'm sorry, Second Chronicles. Chronicles. Um, in Second Chronicles uh, 36, um, 22 through 23 says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now Ezra starts off, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word. Now it is possible that that is to transition it to Ezra and that they were written by the same people, but it's also, just as possible that the later editor of Chronicles wanted to uh, help it to lead into Ezra. You know what I mean? There are other options there. 
Um, so once again, that, that reference there is Second Chronicles 36, 22 through 23. And um, so, some major themes, punishment and blessing, we said a lot. Uh, David's dynasty and the temple and worship. You know, once again, it's not really concerned in the, about what's going on in Israel unless it directly relates with the king of Judah. So, uh, that takes us to the events of Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah has been, has been connected in, in Jewish history, um, so we're going to look at them together. Um, it was written uh, by Ezra and Nehemiah, supposedly, but you know that that's up for debate, definitely. Uh, Babylon falls in 539. The first immigration is in 538, as recorded in chapters 1 and 2. The restoration of the temple is in 538 to 516, as recorded in chapter 3 through 6. The second immigration, which Ezra actually, that's where Ezra actually comes into the story, is in chapter 7 through 8. Uh, the the issue with intermarriage is in chapter 9, confession and separation in chapter 10. Now, I do want to stop there for a second. The issue with intermarrying was not that the other races were, you know, it's like some racism or, or race, um, racially superior or anything like that. The reason why was because these other, these other races were worshipped other gods. And so... Uh, God didn't want them to be unequally yoked, basically how it, come, how it comes out to. Um, so is there something wrong with white people marrying black people? No. Is there something wrong with Mexicans wearing, uh, marrying Brazilians? No. I mean, no. Just no. Um, you know, we've read a lot of things into the Bible that isn't there. You know, the, the people used to use the old, used to use the Bible to support slavery, and now people use the Bible Bible to con to um, um, preach against slavery. So it's just kind of interesting how pe so, some people are just convinced and, and misusing scripture. It's important to know how did it mean to them first before what did it mean to us. So, um, or sometimes, you know, what, what we do is we understand what the Bible says, but we don't understand why it says it, okay, or how it says it. For instance, we read through Leviticus and we read the laws and we're like, okay, this is, this, these are things that we should and should not be doing. But you fail to understand why was it written. See what I mean? And when you understand that the Bible was written so that people would love God and love people, it's a lot different how you apply it. You know, suddenly the issue of tattoos, for instance, doesn't become that big of an issue anymore. So then Nehemiah hops down from 458 or roundabouts there, uh, 450 somewhere, hops down to 445, not that much longer. Um, in Nehemiah 1, where, where Nehemiah gets a pathetic report, and so he goes and starts starts um, ha having them continue the work of the wall. Um, so Nehemiah is commissioned in chapter 2, Jeremiah's Jerusalem's wall and gates in chapter 3 through 6, the exiles in chapter 7, spiritual renewal in, ch in chapters 8 through 10, residents, priests, and Levites in chapters 11 through 12. So, dedication of the wall in chapter 12, final reforms in chapter 13. Now, there is an issue in Ezra as far as history. And let me read it to you, and then I can explain what's going on. In chapter 4, it says, Now when the enemies, and I'm just going to start in verse 1, because I want to give you a little bit of context of what's going on before we get to the issue in 6 through 23. Now when the enemies of Judah and, and uh, Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord, um, God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' households and said to them, Let us build with you, for we, like you, seek your God. And we have been sacrificing to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. Now, if you remember when Israel fell, that's what he's talking about. The, the people that were moved in took on a form of Judaism and were called Samaritans. Okay. Now, they had kind of just been doing their own thing because Judah you know, was living down there. They were living up there. And then they had been taken out. And so now they they brought they were brought back, and this is really the first um, recorded recorded uh, brushing they've had together. But uh, Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of fathers' households of Israel said to them, "You have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God, but we ourselves will together build to the Lord to the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us." Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them. Uh, them from building, and hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And then the people of the land, is, I'm sorry, uh, verse 6, now in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem, and in the days of Artaxerxes, Bishlam, Mithridath, 
Tibil and the rest of his colleagues wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the text of the letter was written in Aramaic and translated from Aramaic. And then in verses 8 through uh, 16, it says what the content of the letter was. And then in verse 17 through the end of the chapter, the work stops. Then in chapter 5, it picks up and says that the prophets Haggai and Zechariah got them to get, wor to get working again. Now, it's very confusing, and the reason why is because it's talking chronologically, but then it takes a break and includes all of the persecution that Israel faced in, in rebuilding and puts it all together. Okay, So first off, Cyrus II was the guy who conquered Babylon and allowed the immigration in the first place, and the temple began work under him. Now, in... Uh, In, in verse 4, it says, um, they frightened them from building uh, from the town of Cyrus all the way down to Darius. Okay, so what that means is during the time of Cyrus here, they, they, they were trying to make it harder for them through his reign, through his reign, and through his reign. All, even, it says, even until uh, um, the king of, um, from Cyrus, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Okay, then in verse 6, it says, now in the reign of Ahasuerus, which is Xerxes the first, okay? Um, they complain again. They, they write an accusation. Now that evidently didn't go anywhere. But then in verse seven, they write a letter to Artaxerxes the first, and that's when the that's when the work ceases, okay? Now when the work ceases, a, um, a person goes to Nehemiah, who's in um, Persia, and and what is that place called? Susa or um, Yeah, in Susa, the capital of Persia, um, <clears throat> somebody goes to Nehemiah and tells him, and he's distraught. And so King Artaxerxes I, that king right there, the reign from 465 to 424, says, um, what's wrong, Nehemiah? And he says, well, the, the work has ceased on the wall. And so, it's, and so then when ne Nehemiah is commissioned, basically he says, okay, you, you can go back and do that. And Artaxerxes I, who is the king who said that the work must stop, then sends Nehemiah and allows him to continue the work. Okay. So then in verse 5, why, is it, why does it talk about Haggai and Zechariah getting the people to start uh, to start working again? Well, that goes back to the reign of Zechariah, I mean, Dar I'm sorry, Darius here in 522 to 486. See, the people had gotten discouraged so probably sometime in the reign of Cambyses II because there was just so much persecution and and you know they just really got discouraged if you've ever been involved with a big project and you know it seems like the whole community is against you it can be very discouraging and um, so that's that's you know um, happening sometime around here but then during the reign of Darius uh, two prophets Zechariah and Haggai come and uh, are, are encouraging them and so they continue the work and that's what chapter 5 is talking about so what it does is in chapter four it talks about all the all the um, opposition that they're facing from the reign of Cyrus all the all the time to Artaxerxes, um, uh, about a, almost a hundred years later. So you know, and then once it's done talking about that, then it hops back to here and talks about the people getting back into work on the temple. So now knowing that, let's go back to this history right here and show this um, as it applies. Okay. So the, the first immigration is in 538, but sometime between, in, 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 within the next eight or so years, the work stops. And um, uh, so Zechariah and Haggai uh, prophesy around 520, and the temple is finally finished in 516. Now, um, the second immigration, after that, and then the wall is finished after Nehemiah comes after 445. So... I hope that that made sense to you. I try to make that as easy as possible. Um, so 558, but he doesn't get in control of Babylon until 539. Then he allows the people to go in 538. Um, they and they stopped their their work sometime at, either at the end of Cyrus's reign or at the in, in Cambyses the Second's reign, and uh, then it's resumed in Darius's reign. So. And then Artaxerxes says, hey, you guys need to stop building, but then he later sends Nehemiah and says, you guys go ahead. Okay, 
So um, just some quick things here. Zerubbabel is actually a descendant of David's throne, and that's why he's mentioned specifically. In chapter 2, verse 1 through 2 of um, Ezra, it says, These came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Reliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mizpar, Bigvi, Rehim, and Banna. And then uh, the significance of Jeshua, who becomes the priest, uh, the high priest, I believe. Um, but he, if you notice, he has uh, ties with the with the other Joshua. Joshua led the people into the land. Jeshua re-leads the people into the land. The same as um, Jeru uh, Jesus would later lead people into salvation and into uh, the heavenly land. So Ezra and Nehemiah does not include all the history. For instance, it blows right over what happens in the book of Esther and is not even concerned with it. And the reason why is because it tra traces what it feels is the most important um, thing, what it feels is the most uh, important historical aspects. Um, so I mentioned about how intermarriage was about syncretism religiously, religious syncretism. It was not about, uh, about interbreeding. Um, so the land and the temple, now they had identity back. They had who they were again. And as a result, a lot of the Jews went to the other extreme and became legalistic. In fact, this is where the root of the Pharisees come from, probably. Um, so, I mean, when, when, when you read about the Pharisees, understand that they were trying to uphold God's law. You know, I know we look at the at the version that, of the Pharisees that we see in the Gospels, and we just assume that they were just terrible people. Well, they weren't terrible people. That it's they were the Billy Grahams of the day. They were the highly respected. You know, they were the uh, Joel Osteens. I mean, unless you don't like Joel Osteen, and then think of someone else who you who you uh, the Joyce Myers, the um, you know the Billy Grahams. The the they were the the the, the preachers of the day, and then the, this guy that nobody's heard of come by and comes by and, and, and starts criticizing them. Realize how important that was. Okay, that was, that was a big deal for Jesus to have done that. Um, but anyways, uh, so they they got they got an identity back with with the land and with the temple. Um, also, I want to emphasize something here: the the no wall meant no defense, and so they they w when they were building the wall, it really was a big deal. Um, invaders and whatnot. I mean, it mentions a few problems that they had with, with people just coming in and killing leaders and whatnot. Um, but no wall meant no defense. This was a different world back then. And so they build the, ta the, the temple, but obviously a temple with no walls, that's kind of a bad idea. So, you know, it was a big deal that that wall was built. That takes us to the prophecies of Zechariah and Haggai. Now, Zechariah prophesied around 520 to 518. And this was obviously during the reign of Persia when after the exiles had begun to come back to the land. Now, his audience was Judah. When I say Judah, I mean the Israelites who had returned back to Jerusalem. Um, he was a grandson of Iddo, and Nehemiah 12, 4 it mentions that. Um, I'll read that right here. Um, 12, 4. Um, Iddo, Ganathai, Abijah, and it's talking about the different people, and he's, he's his grandson. And also in Ezra 5, uh, 1 through 2, it mentions... When the prophets Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo prophesied to the Jews. Now see how it said the son of? He's actually the grandson of. However, once again, son does not mean necessarily direct descendant by father-son relation. Um, in the name of the God of Israel who was over them, then Zerubbabel the son of Shiltiel and Jeshua the son of Jozadak arose and began to rebuild the house of God which um, uh, is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them supporting them. So... Uh, his basic message was Zechariah encouraged the people to finish building the temple. He told them of a future king who would one day establish an eternal kingdom. So a basic outline here, call for return to the Lord in chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. The eight uh, night visions in chapter 1, verse 7 through 6, uh, verse 8. The crowning of Joshua in chapter 6, uh, verse 9 through 15. The observance of fast in chapter 7 through 8. The coming of the Messiah in chapter 9 through 14. <clears throat> Um, so just some, some quick things uh, from the book itself. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting to know the setting of these things because a lot of people historically have misused the prophets to make them to try and make them say something that they never said. They weren't even implying, yet some people quote them out of context. Um, and, and, you know, obviously, uh, when you do that, you miss the point. 
In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you. Um, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Um, and it goes on like that for a while. 2, 3 through 5 says, um, And behold, the angel who was speaking with me was going out, and another angel was coming out to meet him, and said to him, Run, speak to the young man, saying, Jerusalem will be inhabited with without walls because of the multitude of, of men and cattle within it. For I, declar declares the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be a glory in her midst. See, at first that word sounded bad, without walls, wait, what? But then it said, I will be. You know, God's talking, he says, I will be. And so, oh, okay. 3, 2, the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? And then in 4, 6 through 10, um, then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Where are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace grace to it. Also the word of the Lord came to me, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. See, when you understand the context, he's not talking about these other things that people make it out to be. He's talking about the temple. <laughs> so uh, Haggai then, and this will be the end of this lesson, is talking about Haggai. Um Haggai prophesied once again around the same time as Zechariah, around 520 or so, during Persia was, in, was the empire. His audience was Judah. Um, Zerubbabel is the governor, with the, and I mentioned how he was the descendant of David. And Joshua is, is the high priest. And so the message is the people returned to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding the temple, but the work was halted. Haggai's message encouraged the people to finish. So in chapter 1 is a call to action. Chapter 2 is, is separated into three sections. Verses 1 through 9 is a word of encouragement. 10 through 19 is a confirmation of blessing. And 20 through 23 is a restoration of, is a restoration of Davidic kingdom, of the David, Davidic kingdom. Um, 1, 1 through 6 says, In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, so if he reigned in 522, that means that Haggai prophesied in 520. Um the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Um, you know, watch out when you're getting discouraged. I will say that um, sometimes you start interpreting things differently. Then the word of the Lord um, came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled house while this house lies desolate? And then in 2, 10 through 19 um, is another word. On the 24th of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest for a ruling. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with this fold, or cooked, bread, uh, cooked food, wine, oil, or any other food, will it become holy? And the priest answered, No. Then Haggai said, If one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these with the altar, uh, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, It will become unclean. Then Haggai said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. But now do consider from this day onward, before one stone was placed on another in the temple of the Lord, from that time when one came to a grain of heap of twenty measures, there would be only ten, and when one came to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there would be only twenty. Um, you can go ahead and read that for yourself, but you get the idea. And we'll pick up with Obadiah uh, in the next lesson. Um, and the next lesson will actually be the end of uh, this class. We'll talk about Obadiah um, and just some aspects of it there. We'll talk about Joel, Esther, and then Malachi. Now, the reason why I did that with the breaking things up is because even though some of these books happened before Nehemiah um, and during Ezra and Nehemiah and whatnot, uh, I wanted to keep Ezra and Nehemiah together, and since we looked at First First and Second Chronicles, I thought it'd be better to look at the historical aspect before we looked at the at, what was happening during that uh, history. So uh, we'll pick up next time with Obadiah.